Honduran justice approved the extradition of former President Juan Orlando Hernandez to the United States, where he will be tried for charges that link him to organized crime. Russian authorities accused members of right-wing militias and the Ukrainian army for the shelling of a theater in the town of Mariupol. In Japan, authorities confirmed four people dead and 194 injured after a 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck off the northeastern coast of Fukushima Prefecture. Hello there. Welcome to From the South. I am your news anchor, Dio Martin. From the Telstar Studios in Havana, we begin with the news. In Honduras, a resolution on former President Juan Orlando Hernandez's extradition to the United States has been approved. The designated judge, Edwin Ortez, decided to grant the extradition of former President Juan Orlando Hernandez to the United States, where he will be tried for three charges linked to organized crime. The defense claimed that the extradition treaty signed between the U.S. and Honduras establishes that the state should have presented evidence, documents, photographs, audios, videos, transactions to support such demand. After the hearing that lasted for 11 hours for the presentation and examination of evidence, the judge approved the extradition of former President Hernandez, whose defense has three days since Wednesday to file for an appeal that would delay the process for another two weeks. And Peruvian President Pedro Castillo visited the northern town of Retamas, recently affected by a landslide in Peru. The natural disaster buried dozens of homes and trapped at least 15 people. The president invited residents to register in the municipal census so as to leave the risky area and relocate elsewhere. The Retamas Commissioner, Lieutenant Carlos Alberto Valderrama, indicated that police and firefighters are working to remove debris to locate the missing persons. Retamas was hit by another landslide in 2009, which killed at least 13 people, including one child. I am inviting from here the people of Retamas so that they make an effort to register and try to leave this area. It is a very risky area where there are many landslides. There are living on the river. I understand who due to mining influence, have come here to seek better opportunities for their families. Let's move on now. Former Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva expressed fears about the possibility of an attack during the electoral campaign. The Petista leader, who will launch his candidacy for the presidency next April, stated that in spite of this concern, he is a person of great faith and believes that the Brazilian people will re-establish democracy. The ex-president assured that he will campaign in the streets to sell his proposals for the country and stressed that he will seek improvements for the Brazilian people. Last month, Lula moved to Sao Paulo at the request of his advisors and leaders of the Workers' Party to provide more protection. And on Wednesday, hundreds of public workers protested in front of the Ministry of Economy in Brasilia to demand an emergency wage increase of 19.99% from President Jair Bolsonaro's government amid rising fuel prices and soaring inflation. The quality of life of public servants has been affected by inflation, which has directly affected their eating habits, their ability to pay rent, the cost of public transport, both in terms of fares and fuel, which has increased a lot. Although the administrations that succeeded former President Jirma Rousseff practically defunded social housing projects, some of those projects managed to survive, turning former squatters into homeowners. Our correspondent Brian Meyer gives us more details. After the 2016 coup, the Brazilian government cut funding for social housing by over 90 percent. But some projects, which were approved during the Dilma Rousseff administration, were prepared so well that they've been unable to cancel them. In Caruaru, Pernambuco, one of the last projects authorized by Dilma Rousseff, a self-managed autonomous social movement construction project, nears completion. This land was abandoned, not performing any social function. We negotiated and didn't get anywhere, so we got 100 people together occupied the line and camped on it for two years in plastic tarps and plywood sharks. 
Haiti. After years of squatting on this government land, the social movements pressured the federal government to allocate funding for building 139 apartments with ownership prioritized for women. In exchange for maintaining the land clean and doing some of the construction work themselves, ownership is passed over after 10 years of subsidized installments of around 100 reais per month. It was mainly women who occupied this land, and from then forward, we women have been the protagonists working collectively, organizing the meetings. We always do 99.7% of the work. The housing movements hope that Brazil's next president will restart the paralyzed national social housing program in a country that has a housing deficit of five crime rates registered in the country. The protesters blocked some of the main streets in the capital, Port-au-Prince, and protested demand the release of citizens kidnapped by organized criminal gangs in the Caribbean nation. The strike, which has been going on since March 14th, is reported by the Haitian Medical Association that has caused a shutdown of hospitals, clinics, and health centers affiliated to that group, both public and private. According to a report released last February by the United Nations Security Council, kidnappings in Haiti have increased 180 percent in the past year, with 655 cases reported to the police. The number of cases is estimated to be higher as many of them go unreported. And the International Colloquium Homeland in honor of the 130th anniversary of the founding of Jose Martí's newspaper Patria, which is Homeland in Spanish, concluded in Cuba with a view to the construction of digital platforms to spread the truth of the fair causes of Latin America and the world, as they called it. The cultural center Casa de las Américas was a venue chosen for the closing day of this event that brought together influencers from Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Lebanon, the United States, among other countries. The final declaration states that this activity once again uh, demonstrates that Cuba is not alone, that it is moving forward debating and that it meets in the continent's house, which becomes a common and essential horizon for many. The participants raised the need for appropriation of digital communication platforms in addition to developing proposals with a view to improving the continent's quality. Then criticism is no longer enough. It is no longer enough to diagnose and understand that the world is ruined, and the networks don't belong to us. We need our own theoretical process, our own heroic creation of a new way of seeing and understanding ourselves in this complex world, which is no longer the world, not the world of the 70s. The networks have to be a real reflection of popular mobilization. If there are no people in the streets, if there are no people doing their own politics, there is nothing to talk about in networks. And sometimes we want to do in the other way around, that the networks determine the political struggle of the people. I believe that experience has already shown that if there has not been a popular mobilization in Venezuela in the worst times of the war in Bas, in the worst time of the sanctions and blockades, it would not have been possible to defeat the whole imaginary than the U.S. narrative which sought to assassinate the people, an act of genocide against the people of Venezuela. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, welcome back to From the South. Russian authorities accused members of right-wing militias and the Ukrainian army for the shelling of a theater in the town of Mariupol. Moscow accused elements of the ultranationalist Azov Battalion of perpetrating the attack on the facility, which served as a shelter for civilians displaced by the conflict. Regarding this, Russian military authorities emphasized that no operations against ground targets were carried out in Mariupol for the present day. Officials denounced that the Kiev government is trying to carry out genocide against the Russian-speaking population. It also claimed the use of civilians as human shields by Ukrainian forces in battlefronts in the cities of Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernigov, and the capital.
On Wednesday, the Russian Defense Ministry claimed that the Ukrainian Secret Service is planning a provocation by using chemical weapons against civilians. Major General Igor Konashenkov, the Defense Ministry spokesman, said they had information about a provocation using chemical weapons on civilian population prepared by the Ukrainian Secret Service in conjunction with Western countries with the aim of blaming Russia. He stressed that the Russian army involved in the military operation does not possess any chemical weapons. Konashenkov added that the Russian Federation, unlike the United States, has long fulfilled its international obligations by completely destroying all stockpiles of chemical weapons. Also, the spokesperson called footage of civilians queuing for bread allegedly killed by Russian servicemen in Chernihiv a fake. We would like to draw attention to the fact that simultaneously with Ukrainian internet resources, this fake was published on the official pages of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine on social networks, without any verification and obtaining evidence. At the same time, the embassy itself, as you know, has long been located not even in Kyiv, but in Lviv, and in totally ignores how Russian military personnel deliver and distribute hundreds of tons of humanitarian aid to residents of the Chernihiv region in settlements liberated from nationalists. On the very Wednesday, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization informed the global supply gap resulting from the conflict in Ukraine could push up international food and feed prices by 8 to 22 percent above their already elevated levels. Speaking to journalists, Maximo Torero, chief economist at the FAO, noted that prior to the crisis, the agency's food price index had reached a new historical record. Russia and Ukraine are among the most important producers of agricultural commodities in the world. Both countries are net exporters of agricultural products, and they both play leading supply roles in global markets of foodstuffs. According to Torero, nearly 50 countries are dependent on Russian and Ukrainian food for at least 30 percent of the wheat import needs. Of this, 36 countries have over 50 percent of their wheat imports coming from these two countries. In the United States, Joe Biden announced that he will provide more military aid to Ukraine worth a total of $800 million. The new measure brings the total amount of military assistance provided in one week to Ukraine to a total of $1,000 million. This new package alone will provide unprecedented assistance to Ukraine. Joe Biden detailed that the new aid package includes 800 anti-aircraft systems, 9,000 anti-armor systems, 7,000 light weapons such as machine guns and grenade launchers, 20 million rounds of ammunition, as well as drones. The U.S. president commented that at the request of President Volodymyr Zelensky, they will assist the Ukraine in acquiring additional long-range arsenal. 800 anti-aircraft systems. It includes 800 anti-aircraft systems to make sure the Ukrainian military can continue, to, can continue to stop the planes and helicopters that have been attacking their people and to defend their Ukrainian airspace. And at the request of President Zelensky, we have identified and are helping Ukraine acquire additional longer-range anti-aircraft systems and the munitions for those systems. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky delivered a speech via video conference on Wednesday to members of the United States Congress in the context of the tensions between Kiev and Moscow. Zelensky asked the West to increase sanctions on some Russian leaders, and he also pleaded for help specifically for Ukrainian airspace to be declared a humanitarian no-fly zone. He called on the U.S. president to be a warrantor of peace, saying that it is a responsibility inherent to his office. This is the second time the Ukrainian president addresses the United States Congress. Just a few days after that, same Congress approved a $13 billion aid package for Ukraine. Meanwhile, the Russian government argues Washington's support of Kiev does not facilitate a resolution of the conflict over the Donbass region. On Wednesday, Asian Americans from the Atlanta area held a rally to speak out against racism, misogyny, and gun violence on the anniversary of shootings that left eight people dead in that city. Six women of Asian descent were among the eight people killed on March 16, 2021. The the slayings contributed to fear and anger among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders already experienced a rise in hostility and motivated many people to join the fight against it. On stage at the rally, a man struck a gong eight times in honor of each person killed in the shootings. Bonnie Yun from the Georgia Asian Pacific American Bar Association said she is still processing the killings and hoped for a better understanding of the history of Asian Americans in the country.
Um, yes, the tragedy that happened last year, it really shook our nation. It is our 9-11. Um, but as you can see, throughout the pandemic, and even as recently as this past week, the violence continues, to, especially against Asian American women, with 74% of AAPI women experiencing violence or hate crimes during this past year alone. So how do I feel? You know, I look like the women who were killed last year. I still am processing this, but I'm here because I want to break the silence and I want to demand institutional changes from both our elected officials and corporations to say that Asian American voices need to be heard. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Welcome back. In Japan, authorities confirmed four people died and 194 resulted injured after a 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck off the northeastern coast of the Fukushima prefecture. The Meteorological Agency of Japan reported that the earthquake occurred at 23.36 local time off the coasts of Fukushima and Miyagi, where the tsunami warning was activated due to the presence of waves of 20 and 30 meters, but it was later deactivated. Authorities said the weather phenomenon caused a power outage to 160,000 homes plus damages to several roads in Miyagi and the collapse of a residential building in Fukushima. The agency also alerted citizens to the possibility of aftershocks in the coming hours. Along with this earthquake, a tsunami warning was announced on the coast of Miyagi Prefecture and Fukushima, but it has already been lifted. Regarding the damage to the nuclear facilities, it has been reported that the Fukushima Daiki nuclear power plant, the Fukushima Daini nuclear power plant, and the Onogawa nuclear power plant have no air abnormalities in the plant data at this time. Regarding human damage, we have received reports of four dead and 170 injured, and the relationship with the disaster is currently being investigated. Somalia suffers for the third time in 10 years a period of drought and its consequences that affect the most vulnerable population. The lack of water has a direct impact on the daily dynamics of the population, especially those living in rural areas farther away from the city, forcing them to leave their homes and to travel to the capital. Citizens are exposed to violence from the armed groups that control the towns they cross in order to reach their destination. While humanitarian organizations estimate that over one million children could suffer from malnutrition due to the drought. In Cameroon, the teacher's strike, which began in February due to the salary arrears, continues. High school teachers' unions, the driving force behind the strike initiative, are demanding that the government of President Paul Biya pay the huge arrears in salaries, bonuses, and allocations that sum up to about 276 million euros. The teachers are refusing to work, claiming that this debt dates back at least 10 years and they see no willingness from the authorities to meet their commitments. Government-led negotiations over the past few weeks have failed to reach an agreement threatening the continuity of education for hundreds of thousands of children across the Central African nation. We remain in Africa with Libya as uh, conflicts in that nation continue as it waits to hold new elections and elect their leaders. The UN Chief of Political Affairs Rosemary Di Carlo told the Security Council on March 16th in New York their will to contribute in finding a solution was also commented. Di Carlo told the Security Council the Libyan executive is facing a crisis that could, if left unresolved, lead to instability and parallel governments in the country, adding that the United Nations is exerting significant efforts to resolve the crisis. 
The chief of political affairs stated that the United Nations aims to bring together the stakeholders en el resto to agree on the Tendremos entonces que estará parcialmente nublado en el occidente y con poca nubosidad en el resto del país y ya desde el final de la mañana estará parcialmente nublado y se nublará en la tarde principalmente en localidades del interior con algunos chubascos y lluvias que serán aislados en el resto del archipiélago. En la noche todavía estará parcialmente nublado en zonas de la costa norte occidental y también en el centro y el oriente del país y con poca nubosidad en el resto del del archipiélago. Los valores de temperaturas máximas durante la tarde de hoy se mantienen elevados, valores entre 31 y 34 grados Celsius, aunque pueden llegar hasta 35 grados en la provincia de Granma. La noche también cálida, con valores de temperatura ambiente alrededor de 22 y 25 grados Celsius hasta 26 grados en Santiago de Cuba. Los vientos serán variables débiles con brisas costeras durante la tarde y en el mar tendremos oleaje en ambas costas orientales, poco oleaje en el sur occidental y mar tranquila en el resto de las costas. Así que en resumen para hoy tendremos calor y algunos chubascos y lluvias en el occidente del país. Esto es todo en cuanto al tiempo, que tengan todos una excelente jornada y hasta la próxima. Y en la tarde de este miércoles, el primer secretario del Comité Central y presidente de la República, Miguel Díaz Canel Bermúdez, recibió a Citlay Hernández Mora, secretaria general del Movimiento de Regeneración Nacional Morena, quien realiza una visita de trabajo a Cuba invitada por nuestro partido. En amistoso diálogo, ambos dirigentes intercambiaron sobre la actual situación internacional, así como de la realidad latinoamericana y de ambas naciones hermanas. El compañero Díaz Canel él resaltó la importancia de la próxima visita a la isla del presidente de México, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, y agradeció las expresiones de solidaridad con nuestro pueblo. Por su parte, Citlay destacó los resultados de la labor de los profesionales de la salud y científicos cubanos en el enfrentamiento a la pandemia de la COVID-19, el esfuerzo de Cuba en la solución de los problemas de su pueblo y el desarrollo económico y social del país a pesar del bloqueo impuesto por el gobierno de los Estados Unidos. Particip Participaron además por Morena los diputados federales Jorge Toledo y Otoniel García, la encargada de asuntos internacionales Verónica García y Carlos Piacini, coordinadores.